Thank you, worship team, and good morning again, everyone. We are in week four of the series, Follow. It's a phrase we use a lot lot around Woodside. We are followers of Jesus. We are disciples of Jesus. We are following him. Uh, But we're looking at how do we follow someone that we can't physically see or audibly hear? And how do we do that? And we're looking from Scripture that there are places that he calls us to go, places that he calls us um, to meet with him and so that we can encounter him and be changed by him. So, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, sorry. Um, first rhythm, first place of a follower of Jesus, I stay close to Jesus. So I hear the good news, news that someone died on a cross 2,000 years ago for my sins so that I could be restored to a relationship with God and have my sins forgiven. And so I hear the good news about Jesus, and I turn and I trust him as my Savior and Lord. I become one with God again. I'm reconciled to God. But that is not the end of the story. I begin now my journey walking with Jesus, following Jesus. And to follow him means in a loud and busy world, I'm following him, but I need to have a quiet place where I get alone with God and I talk to him through prayer and I hear uh, from him through uh, his word. So I open the Bible and I'm learning more about what he says to me and I'm talking back to him. So I'm, I'm staying close as I go through life. Is that rhythm in your life where there's time out where you take and you're just alone with God? Uh, second, I gather big. To follow Jesus means that I then come together with other followers of Jesus in the church and I gather there so I can encounter Jesus through the preaching of his word, through singing uh, songs to him, through witnessing baptism, through celebrating communion and another of other uh, things that we do at church. And I make it a priority. I need to be at a church as I follow Jesus. And then third, I connect small. And last week we heard about Um, the truth that we are not to to go through life uh, alone or isolated. So I can come to church, but then I can just leave and nobody knows who I am and I'm just on my own. That's not following Jesus. Following Jesus means that I've got people in my life, uh, whether it's a life group or uh, prayer partners or someone that's there for me and I'm there for them, uh, a fellow follower of Jesus, and I am connecting small. And today is share the work. This is another rhythm that needs to be in my life as I follow Jesus. So I'd like to begin this morning as we talk about share the work with this question, who is the greatest, and I'll start with an easy one, who is the greatest hockey player of all time? With all due respect to Gordie Howe, Bobby Orr, and Dan Allen. um, (laughs) Okay, Sidney Crosby. Uh, It's Wayne Gretzky, right? We all know that. I'm up here, you're not. Okay, Wayne Gretzky. (laughs) Who is the greatest actor of all time? Who's the greatest actress of all time? Who's the greatest singer of all time? We live in a culture of celebrity where if you can shoot a puck in a net if you can walk a red carpet, if you can have a number one song on Billboard's Top 100, then you are great, and people applaud you. We live in a culture where it's all about accomplishing things and accumulating things and kind of making a name for yourself. But is that really what life is all about? Now, before I go on, I just want to pause for a moment and mention that culture is in itself not bad. It can be either good or bad. So I don't stand up here and say, oh, culture is bad. But culture needs to line up with the word of God. And where it does, we celebrate that. We say we cheer when, when people in culture are lined up with the word of God. They're doing good things. But when culture is off, we need, to, we need to, to pause and say, wait a second, that's not exactly true or right. And in this case, is it true and right that we're just living for ourselves, making a name for ourselves, and having accomplishments? Stop and think, is that what it's about? Stop and think that 
one day you will be no more and that any accomplishments or accumulation that you have, it will be forgotten. Nobody will care. I was reminded uh, of that this week. I was thinking about this message about um, uh, a record that I had. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but I had three track and field records growing up. And uh, there's no applause. Okay, anyway. (laughs) Three track and field records. And one of the three held for 29 years. Nobody broke it. And I had a couple friends, and they, I can't remember, they texted or emailed me the newspaper clipping. Your record is broken. (laughs) You are, again, a nobody. Yeah, you're just... (laughs) Like, who cares about anything you do? Who cares about any accomplishment? Like, in the end, is that what it's about? No, that's not what greatness is all about. Today, we're going to look at what Jesus says about greatness. We're going to look at about not living simply for the temporary, where everything will be forgotten, but living for the eternal, where what you do will matter for all eternity, and where Jesus will be able to say to you, you are great. So if you have a Bible, I invite you to turn to Matthew, or sorry, Mark chapter 10, and we're going to look at a number of passages to do with greatness. Mark chapter 10, and I'm going to begin in verse 42. Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. Jesus, near the end of his life, is walking into Jerusalem. It's a hotbed And as he's going there, he's going to make his way to die on a cross. But as he's going there, he's quite popular at the time, and the crowds are, they're they're enamored with Jesus and, 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 you know, waving and and, uh, Hosanna in the highest. And as they're going there, two of his disciples, James and John, brothers, have this idea. Listen, when Jesus comes into uh, Jerusalem and sets up his earthly kingdom, We can ask him if we can sit on his right and left, the two positions of power. Now remember, James and John and uh, Peter were three of the inner circle where Jesus spent a lot of time with these three. Could you imagine if I was Peter and I heard about that, how I'd feel? Right, Jesus only has two arms, right and left. Sorry, Peter, you're out, odd man out, right? It says that the other 10, not just Peter, were indignant. They were so upset about James and John asking for power. And it's there that Jesus teaches them a lesson about power, about greatness, and about serving. And he says this, he starts with this. He says, you know the Roman emperor, you know those under the emperor, you know the officials. You know how they lord it over the people, how they use their power to their own advantage. I mean, these are just minions to do their bidding. You know how they flaunt their authority. You know how it's everybody for themselves. And in the first century, they lived in an honor-shame culture where it wasn't just those at the very top who were trying to stay at the top. And if you uh, recall, Julius Caesar was assassinated, but out of the 71 emperors that followed him, many were assassinated, poisoned, killed in, in a number of ways because everybody was trying to get to the top to the position of power where you could have people serve you and do what you wanted. But it wasn't just at the top. Every male in that culture was taught to compete against the other male so that you would receive public recognition, not them. So everybody is clamoring, living for themselves. What does this benefit me? Jesus says, not so with you. I want to pause just for a moment and remind ourselves that we still live in a world, some 200 countries, where there are people at the top, often we call them dictators, who are holding people down, who are using their power for their own advantage, lording it over people. It's it's hard for us to comprehend that here in Canada. We live in a democracy and 
and, uh, and we have rights and we can do different things, but there's countries where people are just pawns used by the person in control. Uh, this week I came across um, this uh, illustration. One, one person um, shared that uh, living under the control, under the power of others with no voice is like playing a game of Monopoly. So can you imagine a game of Monopoly where people are playing um, and they're buying up all the properties and they put hotels in their property and then you're invited to join the game an hour later. Okay, so can you picture that? Everybody's got properties and hotels. You're invited, you're all excited. Oh, I get to play Monopoly. But then you realize you only have so much money and you can only kind of go around so many times. And after a few times, you're just, oh, help me get to go, right? So I can get a little bit more money. But you realize you're landing on these positions of power and you have no money. And for you, the safest place is what? Jail, <laughs> right? Do you know in our world, there are people, really, it's like being in jail, they have no rights. Even in North America, there's this conversation about gender inequality, racial inequality, structural injustice. As followers of Christ, we ought to be pushing for, for uh, those in power to act right, to not simply use their power for themselves. Jesus says to them, you know how they operate. You know the culture you're in. But he says, if you're following me, you're not going to act that way. Not so with you. In fact, if you want to be great, here's what you're going to do. And he redefines greatness, not to do with accomplishments or accumulation. He says, being great in my kingdom, following me, is serving other people. The one that we are following is calling us to live with other people in view. So it's not just about us, but rather it's about helping people. And the one that we're following demonstrated that. He said these words in verse 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Shortly after he said those words to his disciples, they would see him on a cross, giving his life as a ransom to pay the penalty for our sin, to buy us back so we could be restored to God. Notice there in that verse the word many. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're part of that many. That when Jesus went to the cross, he had you in view. Could you imagine that? He's an infinite God. He sees us fully, one person at a time. That Jesus didn't have simply himself in view, but he had you in view. And when you understand how he used his power and position, it changes then how you use any power and position. Because he first loved you, you then love him by serving others. Lord, help me to use what I have for other people. That doesn't mean that you can't be this morning a CEO or a president or have some position. In fact, you need to develop your gifts, but it means when you have a position or you have power, you're not using it for yourself. You're not lording over people, but rather you're using it for other people. It's called servant leadership. Uh, we struggle with this in the church today. They struggled back then because the world, we just want to keep living for ourselves. It's all about self-fulfillment. Do whatever you want to do. Jesus is kind of like value added. He'll just bless you even more just for you. Um, I've mentioned before about um, the prosperity gospel, uh, this health and wealth uh, theology. It's not biblical. People uh, become disillusioned because of it. Right? There was one uh, pastor who said these words. He said, if you're a follower of Jesus, you should live in the biggest house on your street and you should drive the nicest car on your street. 
Okay, there's nothing wrong with a big house or a nice car. You should do that. Why? Because when others on your street see your big house and your nice car, they can ask you, how did you get that? You can say, that's what it's like to follow Jesus. Somebody said that. Listen to the words of Jesus once again in Mark chapter 8. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Following Jesus is not about all about me getting more stuff and making a name for myself. Following Jesus is sometimes saying no to myself to say yes to him, to his way of the cross, to his way of service or sacrifice. If you're going to follow Jesus, you've got to be intentional. I am not going to be seduced by the voices in our culture that say it's all about me. I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to use my power and position for the good of other people. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, Paul writes to this church, because the, the, the early church, they struggled with this power, position, and serving yourself thing. And he writes to them these words, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Now, why would he say that? Because everybody around these Philippian be uh, believers was all about selfish ambition. It was all about vain conceit, making a name for yourself, getting public rec recognition. And Jesus says, rather in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. So Jesus is saying to them, everybody else is doing this, but you do that. And then he again, uh, Paul lifts up Jesus uh, for them to see. He says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross, that Jesus lived with you in view. That even though he was God, he chose to forego his status, come and become one of us, and not just take upon himself human likeness, but he became a servant. He had the nature of a servant so that he could, by humbling himself, die on a cross for you and for me. Again, when you understand what he first did for you, it changes how you interact with people because you want to do it to others. You want to serve others. The early church of, the church of Philippi struggled with this, but also the church in, churches in Galatia, they struggled with this whole living for themselves and I'm better than you kind of paradigm as well. Uh, in Galatians, in uh, Galatians 3, he talks about, he says this, there is neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, slave nor free, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. It's verses like that that we get the picture that where we say, you know, at the cross, it's all level. Nobody's better than anybody else. Because this hierarchy um, had infiltrated the church. And in the churches of Galatia and Turkey at that day, um, people still had that sort of thinking. In fact, we know from Jewish, uh, from synagogue litur liturgy, that the Jewish male would say this prayer uh, on a daily basis, and I've mentioned it to you before, but it was, thank you, Lord, that I am not a woman, thank you, Lord, that I am not a slave, and thank you, Lord, that I am not a Gentile. And so that's men, right? Because you are better than women. That's what they would say. And Paul is saying, no, 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 you stop saying that prayer because men are not better than women, and women are not better than one. You're equal. Look at others as equal. To the church at Corinth, they too struggled uh, with a similar thing uh, in 1 Corinthians 11, he says to them, stop coming together because what you're doing is, is causing more harm than good. They were celebrating the, the Lord's Supper, and he says, it's not the Lord's Supper you're celebrating. It's awful what you're doing. How would you like God to say to Woodside? You guys are, you're, it's awful at Woodside. Right? What, would, what would cause Paul to say it's awful? When they came together for the Lord's Supper, for these gatherings, those people that were higher up, they didn't have to work. So they would come to the house early, and they would eat all the food and drink and get drunk. And then when those that were lower, the servants, 
who had to work all day, they come to the gathering, there's nothing left. And Paul says, that's not how it is in Christ. There's no hierarchies where people are better than other people. So Paul writes to the church at Philippi, churches in Galatia, and the church at Corinth. And similar to Woodside today, he's saying to us, there's no hierarchy. Nobody abuses power. Everybody's looking out for each other, serving one another. I like these words of John Dixon. It's from his, a book on humility, and he says this, humility, okay, Jesus showed humility in dying on the cross for us. Humility is the noble choice to forgo your status, deploy your resources, or use your influence for the good of others before yourself. The humble person is marked by a willingness to hold power in service of others. Humility is about redirecting of your powers, whether physical, intellectual, financial, or structural, for the sake of others. And when you look at Jesus, he used the gift, his spiritual gift of mercy for others. He used the spiritual gift of healing for others. He used the spiritual gift of teaching for others. He died on the cross for others. And there's one other passage or a picture that we see of Jesus that is truly remarkable, and I ask you to turn now, it's in John 13, where Jesus does something for others, where this one that calls us to be great shows us what greatness is like. And in John chapter 13, uh, we read this beginning in verse 1. It was just before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in this world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. This is a stunning picture that Jesus, God in the flesh, comes into Jerusalem. His disciples are arguing who's the greatest. He explains to them it's about serving. And there, as they come into Jerusalem and they celebrate the Passover meal, somewhere in Jerusalem, uh, if you've been to, to Israel, um, they'll take you to a room. They think that's where they had this last supper, this last meal. Um, but they come into this room, and the custom in the first century was that the lowest servant, again, everybody was trying to get up the ladder, the lowest servant was the one that had to wash people's feet because in Israel in the first century, your feet, you either wore bare feet or sandals. They got dusty and dirty and grimy and smelly. And so when you came into a house, um, the host would have one of his servants, uh, if you had sandals, unlatch your sandal, and then wash your feet. The 12 disciples with Jesus come into this room, and they begin to celebrate this meal. They begin to eat. But what's interesting, there's no servant around to wash their feet. And none of the 12 say, oh, you know what? Somebody's got to do this grimy job, I'll do it. Not a one of them. And then Jesus gets up from the table, goes over, pours the water into the basin. He's taken off his outer garment, put on a towel, pours the water into the basin, and we're told that he washes the disciples' feet. Could you imagine that? Jesus washing your feet. I don't know about you, but I was sharing this in the first century. I'm not a foot person. Especially if you've got toenails that aren't clipped. Ugh, that's awful, right? <laughs> like, if I was doing it, I was kind of like, okay, James, washing this one, there you go. And then, oh, John, got yours, there you go. No, he's washing their feet, lifting them up one by one, grimy, dirty, smelly feet. Gets to Peter, and Peter says, no, sorry, sorry, Jesus, you're not washing my feet. And then Jesus explains to Peter, here's, here's why I need to wash your feet, Peter. And then we read these words. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you, he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do 
as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. And Jesus shares with them, I did this for you to give you an example. If you're going to follow me, you're going to redirect your power and your position for the good of others. You're not just thinking about yourself as you go through life. I've given you an example. But John, who wrote this, one of the followers of Jesus, one of the guys that was trying to clamor for power, he tells us there's another reason that Jesus washed their feet. In verse 2, he says Jesus loved them, and he loved them to the end. He loved them to the full. In other words, Jesus wanted to show his disciples how much he loved them. He was going to wash their feet because when he died and rose again and would ascend to heaven, he wanted them to remember how deep his love for them was. And 2,000 years later, when we encounter Jesus and realize we realize he loves me, our response is, Jesus, I love you. And Jesus says, can I ask you now to get up from the table and serve other people in my name? Would you express your love for me by serving these other people that I love? I want them to know me as well. Would you serve in my name? And here's a a reality for us this morning. It's impossible to get close to Jesus and not be overwhelmed by his love. And if you're here this morning and you're not, you you really don't care about people, there's nothing in your schedule where you are serving anybody, it really is a statement that you're not close to Jesus because that's the reality. And maybe today you need to cry out to God and say, God, please help me to understand your love. Please please. Holy Spirit, work in my heart to see that you died on a cross for me, that you serve me, that you love me. Because when you remind yourself on a daily basis of the good news, the gospel, you can't help but say, what do you want me to do in your name? You see, we don't serve others in the name of Jesus out of guilt. We don't serve others in the name of Jesus out of fear, nor do we serve out of duty. We serve out of love and joy and gratitude. Oh God, help me to love this person so that they may just see your love. Help me to serve this person so that they would know you. Now that doesn't mean that serving is always easy. Okay, Jesus puts in the fine print. If you're gonna follow me, you have to deny yourself. You have to say no sometimes. You have to say no to watching Netflix all the time and take some of that time and energy and serve someone. You have to say no to always having something every day of the week in your calendar for you. You have to put it towards me. There's a sacrifice involved. But Jesus says these words. Notice in verse 17, you will be blessed if you do them. He said, it will be so worth it if you serve me. Because Jesus has gone on record in saying that anything done in his name, even the smallest deed, a cup of cold water given, that he will remember that and he will reward that. Jesus, over and over in his teachings, talks about coming again and his what is with him. His what? His reward, right, is with him. I don't know about you, but for, for me, just being with Jesus for all eternity, that's enough. But Jesus says, no, 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 you're not going to outgive me. I'm going to bless you even more. And I think, again, this is just my theory of what rewards look like in heaven, um, Jesus is our reward. And I think those that have served faithfully in his name will all enjoy Jesus in heaven, but we will serve, enjoy him um, to different degrees. But Jesus goes on record in saying, you'll be blessed if you do them. It's worth it to follow me. Jesus measures greatness by our service to others. He's the ultimate commodity trader If you give up a little, if you give up your here and now, where it's not about you, it's about me, and you serve others in my name, you're going to reap this. You're going to get this. I want to bless you. You will be blessed if you do them. Next month, here at Woodside, 
uh, we're celebrating 43 years as a church. Sorry, uh, uh, forget it. Forget it, forget it. Okay. 43 years as a church, and from the beginning to the present day, there have been followers of Jesus who are so captured by his love for them that they have got up from the table and said, where can I serve? And they have shared the work. And today, we're inviting you, if you have, are not in the game here, sharing the work at Woodside that you would. Now, next week, we're going to talk about serving in the community, and some of you, maybe you serve in the community. That's, that's wonderful. We need to do that. But you need to be serving somewhere because that's how you are great in the eyes of Jesus. So for 43 years... We've had people serving. Uh, let me just highlight just a couple. Um, right now, we have the Friendship Club team where we have uh, people who come on Monday nights and say, Jesus, Monday night is yours, and I'm going to be a mentor, a leader, with a, uh, someone uh, with special needs, a special needs adult, and I'm going to serve you. And we have people doing that without fanfare. Uh, we also have the a kids' ministry team uh, there. Uh, and uh, we just heard this week that we have 196 volunteers in our children's ministry. That's awesome. Four more. <laughs> if you sign up today and you are number 200, I was thinking, you win a trip, an all expaid trip to Hawksville. Do it. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Isn't that awesome? We heard this morning, I think, was it 174 people involved with, uh, the, on the prayer uh, team, and that's awesome too. The next slide is the kitchen and cafe team. Uh, the picture on the left is a little dated, but anyway, um, not, not that the ladies are dated, sorry. The, the <laughs> they served a while ago, but um, probably still serving, yes. Um, but you can help out the kitchen and the cafe uh, team here at Woodside, and so often, so many of these people go unnoticed. But Jesus says, if you serve others in my name, you're not only great, but you will be rewarded. I see it, I care, it matters to me. I think all of us here, if we're following Jesus, we say, hey, man, I want to serve. But we have to realize there's a few things that hold us back. I want to highlight four. Number one is we think we don't have enough to offer. If you're a follower of Jesus, you have something to offer. That's just a reality we have we want to help you maybe to find what it is you have to offer. Number two, we're waiting for the perfect conditions. Now, here's, here's the reality. Sometimes we get busy because we have young kids, you know, or we're, we're, work is really, we're going through a season. That's understandable. And there's times where, man, you can't serve. You're just so busy, maybe. You're just exhausted. But if your schedule is always like that year after year after year, you have to stop. And maybe today's the day you stop and you're intentional and say, wait a second, I'm just always too busy which means maybe I'm listening to the voices of the world that all of my time, all of my energy is about me. But you need to say, wait a second, I can do a Tuesday morning, or I can do a Tuesday night, or I can do a Wednesday, I and mean, I'm going to do it for you, Lord. So if you're waiting for the perfect conditions, the reality is, is you're probably going to be busy till the time you die. Uh, number three, we don't think we're needed. Uh, maybe you have the perception here at Woodside, they've got everything covered. No, we continue to plan for more growth, that we'll be able to reach more people for Jesus, which means we need more people in the game serving at Woodside. And then number four, we don't know where to serve. And uh, maybe you're here and you're a new Christian, you're like, I don't know what I can do. Um, you can go online and on our website, we have a spiritual gifts assessment. You can answer a bunch of questions to better help you understand what you're good at and what your passions are, because when you serve in your area of giftedness, um, you last longer, it, and there's more joy in that. And by the way, sometimes there's areas outside of our area of giftedness where there's just a need, and we have to say, no, I'm going to step in and serve there. But you can take a spiritual gifts test, or you can just have a conversation. And that's what uh, we'd like to do uh, at this time. We'd like to hand out these share the work cards and um, ask you just to take a look at them. So if our ushers could hand, hand them out. And you'll notice first uh, with these cards that this is not... Um, saying that, you, you know, put me in, I've, I'm signing a 10-year contract to serve at Woodside. This is simply a conversation. Um, and maybe you're already serving here at Woodside and you're full, that you could just, uh, just look at the card and then pass it back. 
But maybe if you're serving and there's something else maybe God might be nudging you towards, you can check that off. Uh, or, uh, again, if you're not sure where to serve, um, just check something you might be interested in and then someone will follow up with you. So once these cards are collected, we typically hand out these once a year. Um, someone will follow up with you.